For those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie Rogers. Um, I am the president of the Catalog Resume Scholars Association, and I also work here at the Daedalus Foundation as the director of the Robert Motherwell Catalog Resume Project and our programs director. So to give you a little bit of context for where you are, um, some of you have heard me say this before, but the Daedalus Foundation was created by Robert Motherwell in 1991. He first um, incorporated the foundation in 1981 as the Motherwell Foundation, and shortly before his death, changed our name to Daedalus, after Stephen Daedalus and James Joyce. So our mission is both Motherwell's legacy, but also to further the understanding of modern art and modernism. And we honor his legacy by providing a space for dialogue through public programming, education, exhibition, conservation, archives initiatives. So the Catalog Resume Scholars Association is a nice fit for us. So tonight, it's so lovely to have so many of you here. This is such an evergreen topic. Um, I was talking to some of our panelists tonight. Um, we did a mini conference, is what we called it in 2011, on the online Catalog Resume. Uh, we did an event with NIARC, which you'll hear more about later in 2014. At our 2015 conference, we had several um, presenters talk about online catalogs resume, and here we are again. So every few years, this topic comes up, and we hope tonight to approach it from a slightly different angle. Often in the past, we've had a lot of people working on CR projects talk about their databases, their methods, and there's a lot of value to that, and we have a lot to learn from that. But tonight, we wanted to have some people who would act as the stewards of our research in the future to really take a view from outside of our field to look at how we can prepare for the people who will eventually inherit our research. So that's sort of the intention tonight. We'll start with a brief interrupt interruption. <laughs> well, introduction by Andrea Tile, and then we will go into Greg Albers and Stephen Burry. You can find their bios on the, um, on the sheets on your table. And um, we will save our questions for the end. We hope that you will be a very active audience. We really want this to be a dialogue and a conversation with you. So without further ado, Andrea. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrea Teil. I am the director of the Roy Lichtenstein Catalog Raisonné project, which is compiled by the Artists Foundation here in New York. And I'm here today to introduce you to our panel with the title, just to get this right, Preparing for Tomorrow But How, The Future of Online Catalog Resonés. A big thank you goes to Katie Rogers, and the Daedalus Foundation, and the CRSA for hosting us tonight. In a recent announcement for a symposium on digitization and design at Dusseldorf University, Germany, I read that we're currently going through a phase that can be called a digital transformation or even digital revolution. I thought that this must certainly be true. When things are seriously starting to shift within the catalog raisonné world, a major force must be at work. <laughs> Historically, catalog raisonnés haven't been known for operating on the cutting edge of innovation. The last breaking news, I think, must have been the introduction of color images. But here we are today. Digital publishing has become the latest trend in the CR community. Authors and users are equally passionate about online CRs. They open the door to a world in which the users may see and explore an artist's oeuvre in totally new ways. Digital catalogs are so much easier to customize, correct, or update, and so much quicker to access, search, or navigate than traditional printed oeuvre catalogs. A digital version allows for a theoretically unlimited amount of data, is rich in dynamic content and readily available at any time, if we wish so, for any user with internet access. No longer is there a need to purchase expensive books that are instantly outdated once they are printed. No longer do we have to handle simultaneously two or three heavy volumes because artworks are listed in volume one, exhibition history in volume two, and all those abbreviations are deciphered in volume three. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Publishing in a digital environment where anything can be hyperlinked and content can be downloaded at the click of a button makes the idea of producing a printed book no longer feel like best practice. 
Today's call for interconnectivity and open linked data isn't answered by a tangible book, as beautiful or relevant as it may be. At the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation, we decided about seven years ago that a born digital catalog was the way to go. It took some time afterwards to change and adjust our procedures from a strategy that aimed at a multi-volume book to one that matches the needs of an online project. We set up a new interface database. We migrated, merged, and extracted data. We recollected, resorted, and relabeled images of more than 5,000 artworks by Roy Lichtenstein. We established new protocols, styles, and standards for seemingly everything from ownership tabs to title fields to image captions. And we are still in the process of manually linking thousands of artwork records, exhibitions, and publications. Our project has been in the works for 17 years. Catalog raisonnees tend to be creations that need a decade or two or more to be completed. Technology, on the other hand, changes at an ever-increasing speed. For example, when we started, high-resolution images equaled transparencies. They were shot by photographers who knew what they had to do. Our responsibility ended at collecting transparencies and eventually handing them over to the printer. Today, we are expected to prepare precise specifications for digital photos, fine-tuned with changing software, then view the produced images on an expensive screen that must be calibrated by the minute, it seems, and it is us who are asked to define what we need. Not to mention the labor of setting up an elaborate labeling system for digital files in countless formats, and for those, and then all those scans and rescans of the aging transparencies. And while we are preparing this, technology keeps changing. In 2001, when we started, no one knew what an iPhone was. The first iPhone was released in 2007. It took three more years for the birth of the iPad. When our catalog will go online in a few years, there may be new devices out there that we cannot even imagine today. And here is the downside to our digital publications. They are fragile, and they come with real longevity challenges. While books have been around for a while and the libraries that preserve them are established institutions in the modern world, no one really knows where technology will lead us or what the future <coughs> of the internet holds. What makes sense for digital publications today may no longer make sense even in the near future. Many CR authors are art historians, and as such, at least in my generation, we haven't necessarily been trained in computer science or technology. We have become accustomed to continuously expand our skill sets ever since we let go of our typewriters. But do we now all have to study international standards of archiving just so we're able to even understand our web consultant? The fact is, if we want our born digital catalogs to survive more than the next few rounds of software updates, then we need to face up to the challenges of digital publications. And to engage in related conversations has now become a part of our due diligence. Which brings us to tonight's panel. The idea for another panel on digital catalog raisonnees was born a few months ago when I started to look into our upcoming online CR launch. The Roy Lichtenstein Foundation is a sunset foundation. At some point, we will no longer be around to care for software, upda software updates, negotiate repository fees, or ask someone to run checksums that ensure that our data is safe and continues to be accessible. And so I was searching for the latest options of reliable long-term repositories. The good news is, there are various institutions and organizations out there that think deeply about born digital projects and their future. There are web research groups, task forces on archiving, commissions on preservation, and a growing number of other professional communities that work together to set the standards for digital preservation. NIARC here in New York and the Getty Foundation in LA are just two of them. There's a lot of intelligent and useful information out there 
I learned, for instance, that the National Digital Stewardship Alliance established five topical areas we should focus on when embarking on a digital publication project. Storage, data integrity, security, metadata, and file formats. They also defined four achievable levels of digital preservation for these areas. Once we've achieved these levels, we come close to best practice, meaning our digital project should remain safely stored and usable long term. The question is, how do we get there? Whom should we ask for advice or support when we're ready to walk down that path? What are the key questions we should all ask? And how can we prepare for the time when we are no longer around, in five years, 25 years and beyond? Who will be the custodian for our digital projects? Should we have a single or rather multiple stakeholders? Last but not least, who will protect the content of our CR websites in the future? The authenticity of information and images we published. What about version control, the risk of hacking? Over the past months, I asked several colleagues about their digital long-term plans. The replies confirmed that everyone feels that we are at a conjuncture. We're still searching for what may work best for our projects and not to forget our budgets. It doesn't make things easier that every catalog raisonné project is different. Some of us are now regularly downloading PDFs of their online versions, hoping that those will still be around and accessible when online access may fail. Others prefer to wait and see and decide later how to preserve their project. And then there are those who are going to publish a web CR and a traditional book. Is that perhaps what we all should do as best practice? When we're thinking about the future, it's always a good idea to take a look at what a specific group of academics has to say, whose main focus is the future itself. They are also referred to as futurists. Yes, it is true, to read or listen to their research can be irritating. <laughs> their visions often range from that's difficult to imagine to that's just plain scary, but they do have interesting things to say. Richard Watson, for example, a British writer and lecturer at London Business Schools, concludes that the future will bring, quote, the convergence of everything, unquote, and, quote, you either surf the wave or you get drowned, unquote. It may not come as a surprise that in a video of one of his presentations, where he is mapping out the future, literally on the wall, we learn that anxiety, worries, or even fear of the future sits right at the center of this map, meaning, and our view of the future. <laughs> but Watson also points out that while many things will inevitably change, there are others which won't. For example, us humans. I find this an interesting fact to be considered when we ponder about what future researchers may really need when they consult our catalog raisonnés. Another futurist who teaches at MIT's Media Lab, David Rose, wrote an inspiring book titled Enchanted Objects. He foresees, among other things, that computer screens as we know them today, those flat glass labs, will soon be obsolete. They will be replaced by connected technology that is embedded in objects. Now, what would that mean for catalog raisonnés that are designed to be viewed on a screen? What futurists generally remind us of is the future isn't the thing out there that just comes and runs us over. It is actually us who have it in our hands to shape it, to discuss and decide what the future should look like. And so I'm very pleased that we have <coughs> stepped out of our catalog raisonné research silos tonight to welcome Stephen Burry and uh, Greg Albers. And we can't wait to hear your thoughts and to discuss together the future of online catalog resumes. Thank you. Tough act to follow. Um, 
Thank you for that introduction. I think I set up a lot of um, what's going on in the community, both I think I assume for you all and also for other people tackling digital publishing and online publishing as well. Um, just briefly, um, I'm Greg Albers. I'm the digital publications manager at the Getty um, in Los Angeles. I've been there for about five years. Um, and it's my job to publish digital publications, um, but also to think about how we can help others do the same. Um, so that's in part the reason why I'm here today. So my part of the talk is really going to focus on, on this idea. Um, are there best practices for preparing a future-proof online catalog raisonné? Um, so really um, tackling the preparation part, the thinking, the conceptual part, um, the actual doing of the thing before it's then out in the world. Um, and my, my talk title is going to give away my entire talk. This is my main point. Um, assume that despite all your best efforts, it will all eventually break. So if you want to just let that soak in, tune out for 20 minutes and wait for Stephen's talk, that's fine. Um, this is pretty much the main point that I'm going to make here today or try to make here today. So as I said, I've been to the Getty for about five years, um, but digital publishing started there, or the Getty's interest in digital publishing started in 2009 with the Online Scholarly Catalog Initiative, um, which was an initiative of the Getty Foundation. Um, we call it OSCI or OSCE. Have, how, can I see a show of hands about how many people have heard of OSCE before? Okay, maybe a th quarter of the room, that's good. So um, Online Scholarly Catalog Initiative, or OSCE, was a foundation initiative that granted eight museums money to go out and, and figure out if they could publish their collection catalogs online. So much like Catalog Raisonnés, these collection catalogs were big tomes of volumes. Um, they took years and years to produce. They were massively expensive and out of date the moment they were printed. So the foundation wanted to figure out, like, does this, do these things belong online? Um, and at the time, it was not at all clear. I think that there was a real question about whether this was going to work at all, uh, let, an, let alone how it was going to work. But at the end of that initiative, um, it, was, um, it was a success. Everyone published catalogs. Um, all of them have gone on to publish more catalogs or have, or have plans to do so. Um, and, and largely, proved the, they kind of proved the point that yes, these catalogs could be online. Um, the question then was just really how do we do it best? How do we best put them online? Um, out of that, out of that um, the OSCE initiative, there were these four remaining challenges that were identified as things that they hadn't kind of figured out or want, knew that were still issues that they wanted to figure out were they to sort of move forward. So those were um, finding the catalog. So you put a digital publication online, it's on your homepage for a little while, it's a big exciting thing, everyone can find it, it's getting some attention, then it's not the most exciting thing and it has to be go off the homepage, then it's like where does it go, is it in publications or is it in the shop or is it in curatorial or where, like where is it? Um, so finding the catalog, simple, like obvious, but a, a challenge. Um, Reader confusion about catalog boundaries. So this was specific to a few museums who kind of integrated their collection catalogs into their sort of overall website. Um, so they did some user testing afterwards and found that users were like confused about where the sort of online scholar, the scholarly part started and ended and where the sort of more kind of general museum stuff started and ended. Uh, the third one was preserving online catalogs for the public. So we're gonna talk about that one in a minute a lot more, um, and then sustaining digital publishing. So this was around the idea of like how do we've, we've done this once, we got several hundred thousand dollars from the Getty to do it, um, how do we do this again without the Getty continuing to fund it? So these, for these, for me, these sort of four challenges, I kind of put them in some buckets. One is, I call it discoverability. One is objectness, which I'm pretty sure is a real word. Um, and the last two I call are kind of longevity. And it's the preserving online catalogs for the public of that part of longevity that I'm going to try to talk about more here today. Okay. Um, so you don't have to write this all down because we'll post the slides. I'm sure we can share links. But there are now existing a number of um, guidelines for creating preservable websites that come from the Library of Congress and Stanford and Columbia University. Um, everyone has kind of looked at this. Stephen's going to probably touch on this later in his talk as well. But there are things like um, building your website to be accessible, using documented standards-based formats, um, so basic you know, non-proprietary formats or things that are at least documented as well. Um, including a, technical things, like including a site map. Um, I like the manage your robots text. I mean, if you know what that is, good for you. Um, but it's a thing that actually does matter when you talk about how sites are archived. 
Um, but we can learn about more about this in offline at another time and um, in further conversation. I want to kind of take it a sort of a higher level um, in terms of what we want to talk about here. So I want to make two main points. One, my first big point is minimize dependencies. If, so my title of my talk was good. This is also, if you're going to remember the second thing, remember this, okay? Minimize dependencies. And what I mean by that is a few different things. Um, one is I want you to minimize dependencies on machinery. Um, so publishing now, the, the, the sort of metaphor of, publish, of digital publishing isn't, the digital publication is not like a print book. The digital publication, more often than not, is like the press and the print book together. The, the way that websites often operate is that they need, the machinery of a website needs to continue to run, okay? You, when, a, when a visitor comes to your website and wants to look up um, a particular artwork or information about multiple artworks, they perform a search. Behind the scenes of that website is there, there's machinery is churning. There are databases that are being queried. There are templates that are being built. And the pages are being written and built and served up to the user. So every time a user visits a, a website that's built in that way, that machinery has to run. The printing press has to run and spit out a new copy of that page. If you stop and think about that, as a publisher, that should make you like wildly uneasy. Um, it makes me very uneasy, and I know I have a sort of a, I do some technical work, and I still I don't like the idea of a book that I'm publishing reliant on a constantly moving machine. So anything that you can do, and these are things that these sort of ideas that what I want you to take away from this is things that you can think about yourselves, but things you can ask your partners, ask your web developers, ask your service providers, your vendors, whoever you're working with to build these things. Um, ask them these questions, talk about these things. So think about how you can minimize dependencies on machinery. So dependency in, in technical terms is anything that you, your resource, your publication is dependent on to, to, be, to run. If you're dependent on a lot of machinery, um, that can be problematic. So that means you have to keep the machinery running. So if you can find tools and platforms that have less moving parts um, or parts that are easy to fix and replace or no parts at all, even better, if there's nothing that has to run to be able to serve up your book, great is my take on things. Um, and I'm going to share at the end what our approach is at the Getty and how we've addressed some of these issues. Um, but if all else fails, if you, if you have machinery, if it is complicated, if, if, you're, if you're committed to this thing that does take quite a bit to keep running, have a fallback. Um, if you have complicated machinery, have a fallback to that plan when the machine, assume that the machinery is going to break, okay? And we'll talk about fallbacks too in a minute. All right, one, so dependency on machinery. Next, dependency on money. All right, this is a big one. This is the, on the OSCE museums. They had gotten a lot of money to publish their book, and when that money went away, they had to find a way to keep going. They had to find a way not only to keep their existing publications up and running, but also to keep publishing as well. Um, and, you, and even small amounts of money are still gonna add up. So think about web hosting and server space and even more maintenance costs and fees to keep things running. And say you have a, you're on a foundation, you have, you're committed to you know, $100 a month, $500 a month, $1,000 a month. But how long, really, can you keep that up? Can you keep it up over the life of what you expect your book to last? And if you think about a book that was published 200 years ago, are you ready to pay web hosting fees for 200 years? Are you ready to guarantee that when you're gone, when the foundation is gone, who's going to keep paying those fees? Are you, are you you're expecting your kids to? Are you expecting the next generation of scholars to? And is that really reasonable? So and again, anything you can do to minimize your require your sort of the needs of on money, the better. Um, and also, don't bank on someone else's money. So um, if it's easy to get up and running on a nice system um, and to do a lot of great work really upfront, if you've got a lot um, a lot in the bank and someone's bankrolling you, but if that goes away, what's going to happen? And again, assume the money's going to run out. Assume you're going to go broke. Assume your kids aren't going to want to keep up your catalog raisin, your life's work. Assume that the that the foundation is gonna go bankrupt. Um, it's gonna be embroiled in some scandal somewhere. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I put that in. Um, I don't know why, it's like, I'm trying to spice it up. I assume that there's all kinds of like, there's all kinds of like stories to be told in the catalog of Raisin A world. <laughs> right? Okay, afterwards I wanna hear those. So, plan on having a fallback, okay? All right. 
one more kind of dependency. <laughs> All right, dependency on format. So aim for your core content to be format agnostic um, and repurposable in its fi final form. So if the content of your book, if accessing the content of your book requires a very, very specific system, a very kind of specific device, a very specific browser, a very specific anything, that can be very problematic because again, you're putting a lot, of, a lot of weight and a lot of dependency on that one very specific thing. If, you, if your content is format agnostic, by which I mean your content um, can go in any kind of format or is not, is, is kind of the sort of core content is, is put in a way that it can easily be repurposed, um, that's gonna make it a lot easier. Even if you don't do that repurposing right now, it will make it easier down the, down the line. One example I can give at the Getty, um, we early on, we did some experimenting in digital publishing and trying to find like, and this was actually museums in general, um, trying to find like the best avenues for digital publishing for our art books. Um, and one of the things we tried was an app. Um, it was the guidebook for the, the collection guide, sort of the, the highlights guide. Um, and so we found, we started working on this app. We found a developer who was doing apps like this for other museums. Um, it seemed, it was pretty simple to do. We were able to give them content. Um, they put it in a nice app form and, and handed it off to us and it was great. And it did really, you know, we, we sold it for a few dollars and we lowered the price and we sold more of them. We lowered the price again, we sold even more of them. Um, and we realized the apps don't sell, you don't, can't sell for too much money. Um, but every time Apple upgraded its, its operating system, the app had to be updated too. But this was an old book that we were like not super committed to. I mean, it was just the highlights book and we're kind of like, it was an experiment. We're like, I oh, don't, okay. And so the we would call the developer and be like, can you update this? And you know, they, they would sort of begrudgingly do it. Um, but then eventually the developer was bought up by another company and that, it was fold, that sort of system that they had built was folded. Um, and so they did one last update and then we weren't able to update it anymore. We knew and we were like, well, that's it. We also couldn't get the content out super easily. It was in such a form, we could crack open the app, we could get to the text, but it was in such a sort of, um, the way that it was formatted was in so specific to the app, to that app, that particular app, that it was basically useless. So any edits that we had made in the, in, you know, in the final pass, um, any, new, any new text that we sort of emailed them a paragraph to drop in and we didn't keep track of it, that was all gone. Um, so no, don't be dependent on a single format. Also, I say um, choose at least one well-documented, standards-based, open format for your publication. So again, you can have a very, um, you can have a, a flashy app that's made by a specific developer. I, I don't know if anyone's doing apps, but um, it can be, it can have a lot of bells and whistles. It can be kind of amazing, but make sure again that you have, do at least one format that's like, even if it's just like a PDF, I think Andre mentioned, or a Microsoft Word document that you have, like anything very basic that you know you can, you can get back into. And again, at the end, even if, if, if you do what you can and it's still dependent on the thing, on your, on the, has dependencies on format, um, make sure there's a fallback, okay? So fallbacks. That's my second point. So this is the third thing you need to remember today. Um, if you have a dependency, also have a fallback. And this is what I mean by fallback. So a fallback is when you have something like a video, it should then, like if the video player doesn't work anymore, if YouTube goes away, you should have in the back some, you know, some um, video stills from that, from that video. Or if you're doing in a print book, you have a URL to, to show it, the video somewhere else and then sort of another source. Maybe it's hosted somewhere else as a backup. Maybe you have it in YouTube and Vimeo in your own site. Um, if it's audio, have a transcript available. Um, if there's a 360 degree rotating image for a sculpture catalog, have the four main views and static JPEGs as well. Um, if you have a sort of fancy hover over glossaries, also have a, just a straightforward glossary in the back or on a page. Um, if, you, if you're building a really dynamic website, think about also trying to take it down to an ebook and take it down to a PDF and then a, even to plain text. And I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute too. If you have a big database, it's in a specific database system. Can you get a JSON output? And for non-developers in the room, JSON is a, a sort of plain text data format that's very 
um, widely known in the web world and can be easily repurposed and in, in, in to something else. So if you have a JSON version of your data, of your catalog data, uh, a good web developer could take that and build a sort of new site around it in many ways. Um, and if JSON fails, what about a CSV? Like a CSV, uh, which is an Excel document, is not a very exciting thing to be a digital publisher of. Like that's like, hey, I, I spent 10 years and I got this awesome Excel sheet. <laughs> like that's very unsatisfying. But you will thank me in 20 years when your awesome website has, gone, has done what other awesome websites do and kind of fallen apart a little bit and it's gotten harder to maintain. And now at least you have the Excel sheet and that's data that other scholars can use and build off of and, and make something new and, re, and repurpose. Um, so all of these things are, have been be, sort of, and coming out of the OSCE program for us, all of these things have been sort of mantras for us and, and things that we're really trying to take to heart in our own publishing work at the Getty. So I'll show you a little bit of that now. So they're animated GIFs. Um, so these are a couple of collection catalogs that we've published just to give you an idea of what's in there and I'd invite you to go, we'll, I'm sure share some links, I invite you to go check them out as well if you haven't online, see the real things. They're very dynamic, they've got zooming images, they've got those rotating images I've talked about. We've done some with videos in them. They have dynamic um, sort of interactive maps that are all labeled and connected to the different objects so you can see where everyone is, everything is from. Um, they have um, hover over glossary definitions, they have pop-up windows with images in them and with footnotes. Kind of all, a lot of the bells and whistles that you come to expect and want to build into a digital publication. You want to, if you're building a digital publication, if you're taking the time, you of course want it to be dynamic. You want to take advantage of that space. And so we're really trying to do that as much as we can. But we're also thinking about dependencies and fallbacks. So even though we're doing these very fancy online sites, we're building them in a way that can also into multi-format publishing. So all, those, all that information that's on, that online, on those online sites can be sort of simplified down and we put out ebook versions, we put out PDF versions, um, and we put out a print version as well. The, that multi-format approach for us has a couple of, a couple of big benefits. One is that um, now we have these different formats that if the website breaks, I can always point to the ebook or PDF. If the ebook format, if like EPUB is a spec specification, is sort of nixed and no longer a thing, I have the PDF. Um, and so it really helps sort of minimize the sort of risk that we're taking on any one format. Um, the other thing it has, the other great benefit to, to multi-format multi publishing is it, is it tackles another one of those things, those challenges that were remaining challenges from OSCE in discoverability. So now we have our book where other books are. So when people aren't just look, coming to the Getty website looking for a random collection catalog, um, they are looking and they're finding that collection catalog in WorldCat, um, in Google Books, in uh, the Library of Congress, in uh, Amazon, Apple, like it's everywhere books can be. So that's sort of the second benefit of this approach. Um, I mentioned print as well. So um, it's in, it's, we print out, we do print on demand copies. Um, and it gets into libraries. This is a picture of that catalog at the Louvre bookstore. Um, it's, yes, it's in a bottom shelf in the shadows, and, <laughs> but it's in the Louvre bookstore, so I uh, take my wins where I get them. Um, it's, they're in the sales catalog around with all, along, right alongside all of our other publications, um, so they're all there. To do this, this multi-format publishing, and, to th and all of this is because we're thinking about dependencies. So like the, rota again, the rotating images, the zooming images, the interactive maps, all of those are built into our system to have fallbacks because they need to also work in a print book in some way. So we think of the print book as kind of a reference of the main, the main meat, the main content of the book, and the digital stuff we're, able to, we're sort of able to layer on a lot onto the website, but we still have the core content in the print book as well. And all of it is in plain text. So at the very end of the day, at the bottom of all of that multi-format publishing, every chapter, every entry, catalog entry ends up in a file that's just like this. It's human readable. It's got some formatting in it that like at the top, you can kind of see it's got a data format. It's called YAML. It's written in Markdown. So these are buzzwords you might hear at some point again. Um, uses very simple formatting to indicate things that are like italics or block quotes or headings and that kind of thing but it's totally human readable too. So again, if the web internet dies, if, um, if EPUBs go away, eBooks go away, Amazon falls apart, um, PDFs are like 
Adobe scoops them back up. It's like no one can read PDFs anymore. Um, we still have the plain text documents that I can reuse. And they're all just in a folder of, like, on, this is my computer. This is on my laptop, a folder full of files that I can access anytime I want. Um, so this is a system that we've been building and working with. Um, we've published six books this way so far. We, are, we have another 12 in the pipeline over the next five years um, with more added, like it seems like, every month. Um, and we're working on open sourcing this software as well. So we're, we call it Quire. Um, Q U I R E, um, which is an man old manuscript term, and then like the one, the, like the one single word book-related term we could find that our lawyers would let us use. Um, <laughs> like I would, we would send her a list of words. We're like, let's call it this, and she'd be like, no, you can't. Let's call it this. No, you can't. So, choir turns out to be something we can use. Um, so we're working towards open sourcing this as well. So, catalog raisonné publishers, um, other museums, scholars, whoever can kind of take this approach as well. And that's it. Thank you very much. Nice. You're a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, oh, no. <laughs> um, I'm going to really start with an apology, is that the real person who should be talking for NIOC and web archiving I uh, can't be here tonight, Sumitra Duncan. She's actually at a conference at uh, this place here, the IIPC, which is the um, International Internet Preservation Coalition. So you've got the sort of reserve person here tonight. <laughs> but I do claim that the idea of web archiving art-rich resources in an art environment was, was my idea. So <laughs> get that in. Um, and the other organisation. This is a, 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 a difficult organisation. You have to have a, a big wallet to afford a subscription to it. And there's like 35 primarily national libraries, some large universities. Uh, but you can turn up to their conferences. They have a, a day, uh, they don't charge for it, and you can um, go and learn. And you can also take part in some of their working groups as well. The other organization, oh, gone too far, have I? Uh, never trust the web. <laughs> turn off, you did turn it off. Uh, I broke it too. Okay. Oh. There we go. Oh. Gone again. It doesn't like that second slide. It doesn't like that slide. Uh, they're working, on, the they're point working here. on the back. Oh, wait, oh, we have something. We have something. <coughs> Is that what? No, it's not the one we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need your thumb drive back. <laughs> we'll take a brief pause <laughs> to reload. <laughs> right, I can talk. The only way of web archiving is to print it out in vellum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely don't use a PowerPoint. It's not a good backup <laughs> format, probably. Um, the other organization is the um, National uh, Digital Stewardship um, uh, Coalition. Um, and they, um, again, that's a, a primarily US-based thing. And there's like several hundred uh, members of it, and the fees are quite low. And there's a group that specializes in web archiving as a use case. Um, so why did NIOC, and that's Frick, Brooklyn, and the Museum of Modern Art, decide to get into uh, web archiving, other than my persuasive charm? Um, it was really that the internet archive that everybody relies on for um, for, for archiving um, can't really be relied upon. Um, they're doing thousands, millions of websites. They uh, operate at a very high level. They don't go more than sort of three moves down a site. And there's no real control over uh, how many times they might troll uh, harvest a site over, over a year or, or whatever. Um, and the thing that we found most of all um, was that they didn't do a lot of quality control. Um, there's a nice slide, 
I can promise you it's a nice slide, um, is the MoMA site for the Matisse uh, exhibition. And the internet archive crawl um, is practically blank except for the top of it. And we have to do something called patch crawling where um, our interns, um, they're paid interns, um, <laughs> flog their way through the, the gaps and look at the site and, 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 and crawl it in sections. That's why the site map's very important. We need site maps um, on, on a website. Um, so the quality control is really the, the issue. And almost anybody can archive a website, but actually archiving all of it is difficult. Well, harvesting is difficult. Archiving it is even more difficult. Um, what we try to do also, we got it. I don't remember that one. <laughs> ah, that's the IPC. Can we go full page? I think he's going to load. He's going to. There we go. Right. So that's the NDSA um, and the interest group on websites. And this is why we're web archiving. And. <coughs> That's the Wayback Machine, so anybody could yeah. propose to do that. And it's, we, we need the Wayback Machine. Um, and we really need the Python Wayback Machine, which we haven't got on that. So this is the Matisse slide that I promise you. On the left is what the Internet Archive was archiving. <laughs> on the right is what we patch crawled. Um, but there's a question also, how authentic is our patch crawl? Because it's done after the event, um, so that's a, an issue, uh, it doesn't really match. So um, at the moment we have 40 catalogue raisonnés um, on, on the site. Um, we, can't, we can't do the, the search, we can't do the search because a database thing at the moment is possible but it would take probably half a year to do it. You need access to the software and permissions and licensing, all that sort of thing. Um, so what we do is we, we encourage websites primarily to um, have browsable features so we can access the content of individual entries through browsing. So that's something I would encourage people to do. So uh, it's permission-based, nobody get, get worried, we don't do this without permissions. Um, and um, you can suggest, we have a, a suggestion form, so you can suggest what you would like us to archive there. Um, on our website we also have these um, frequently asked questions, and one that doesn't show on here is, um, how can you enable your website to be um, a crawl success more successfully? And this is one that we did crawl, the, the Gucci Foundation. Um, so Web Recorder is a, a supplemental tool. It's a New York-based project from out of Rhizome and a new museum. There's probably people here tonight. And they're making a more sophisticated tool that can be used alongside the Wayback and the uh, Archive It uh, crawler. Um, and uh, it's very good for difficult sites. Um, anything with a lot of JavaScript um, and um, you know, things like that. Uh, lots of illustrations, dynamic video. Um, that's the thing that we would use specifically to get that bit of the site um, and in fact we were having trouble with one of your sites so we had to use web recorder to get that oh not one of the getty sites one of the the art institute of chicago's site just to be sure <laughs> the, 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 Get, the getty did help it was part of the oski the part of the oski it's foundation OSCE thing yes, yes. It's an OSCE yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so and it's quite successful we're quite pleased that you know the combination of the two you can't use web recorder all of the time because at the moment, it's not got a fully automated crawl. 
we'd use it for difficult bits of a site. Um, and again, um, you were talking about making, finding things. So we put our things in multiple catalogues and it <coughs> appears in WorldCat um, and other things like that. Um, and really, at this point, we've been talking about harvesting rather than archiving. Um, so now we um, actually put all the data, is copied through an app from the Internet Archives, archive it straight into our account in JuraCloud, and it's backed up in JuraCloud. The only problem arises when archive it, the the, bit, the subscription bit of the Internet Archive, uh, if it updates its software, it can lead to metadata problems. And recently they updated it and we had to sort that out. Um, what we've been trying to do is um, persuade the Internet Archive to um, respond to change and developments in technology. So they have a ticketing system. And I think we've become the most... Um, pesty um, <laughs> organization. We, I think we had the record of something like 400 tickets um, one year, so um, it's, it's quite major. But it, it improves their performance and it improves it for everybody else. So. Um, right, so um, this is a, a sort of side sweep, is that people who are making um, Catalog Rizone are obviously going to be using websites for resources, documenting a show of an artist at a particular gallery that's on a website. And we're encouraging people to actually document their exploration of websites. So this is just one way of permalinking. Um, it's an account based thing that's just free up to a certain point, but you probably have to more than 20 sites, you probably have to do it. Um, but this brings me to the point that um, what we haven't really been ever been talking about is the user. What does the user want? What does the user actually want to do in the future with archived uh, catalog raisonné? And um, a few years ago, two years ago, in fact, we actually set up a digital art history lab and we've been doing sessions on permalinks and how to track things down. But we're working <laughs> also, how can you search across multiple catalog raisonnés and find data that the, the, the gallery that used the same, uh, that sort of showed the same artist. And we, I've got a sort of dream project with Columbia. Columbia University have um, been archiving um, sort of um, sort of development in New York City. And we've also been archiving galleries in New York City. And they're sort of intimately linked as, as sort of galleries colonize an area, um, then it gets redeveloped. So one of the projects I would like to see happen is that sort of activity. And I think thinking about who's going to use the data in ways that we haven't actually ever thought of is really important. So. Apologies for the slides going awry, but that's more or less what I wanted to say. And if you need any technical advice, Sumitra Duncan's the woman to ask. But wait till she gets back from New Zealand. Uh, wonderful. So um, we'll do a, a moderated um, section briefly, and then we'd like to open it up to the audience. I'm sure a lot of you have questions. Um, please wait for the mic to come around uh, before you ask your question. Um, I found that um, equal parts comforting and terrifying. Um, and I think, you know, I, I liked the idea, though, what you were saying, Stephen, about um, a, a digital art history lab, because a lot of us are relying on the internet and digital resources in our own research that goes into a catalog resume. Um, so I, um, I gathered some questions from members um, and put some together myself, but one person was curious about um, how your preservation partners are um, 
evaluated for inclusion in NIARC's web archiving program? For instance, with the catalog resume, is there an expected level of scholarship or a certain level of recognition for an artist? Or how, how does someone become a part of NIARC's web archiving program? Um, the first stage is to, for somebody to propose it to us. Um, and it's better if it's the copyright owner who <laughs> does that, uh, but that's another issue. You know, can we legally do it and get permission? And then we, we then do a technical assessment. Can we actually make a copy of it? And most cases we can, some cases we can't. Some cases the organization doesn't want to do it, they don't want to keep it commercial or whatever, so there's a whole range of things. But I think um, we do, we have a, a, a selection group who look at any site pro proposed and we do assess it for uh, academic significance. Mm -hmm. But if it was an artist, on, on, it was the only thing on an artist that would override it. Okay. Great. Um, so Greg, um, this was something we talked about before the panel, is that with the Gettys Oski project, which has now closed in 2017, there are nine lessons that were noted on the website. Um, and I'll just read through them quickly because I think they're all really relevant today. And I hope that you might touch on how these, um, uh, you turned uh, your focus onto challenges now, but I wonder if you might touch on a few of these as related to catalogs resume specifically. So the nine lessons, and uh, the first one is online publications are authoritative. And I thought that was a really interesting one to put in because when we had that 2011 um, conference, the mini conference on the online catalog resume, one of the questions from the audience was, is an online catalog resume a catalog resume or is it something else? Because a catalog resume has always been known to be something that is stable and static, that it's something that you can always refer back to, but if it's constantly updating, is it something else? And I think this, there was some sensibility behind that about whether or not it's authoritative if it changes. Um, the second point was choose technology wisely, which I think you <laughs> very much underscored today. The third was right size the project. The fourth was make sure your content is ready. The fifth is intellectual property is manageable, and that might touch on what Stephen just mentioned. Um, find ways to serve multiple audiences, also very relevant I think here. Design matters. Get the right people and structure in place and think sustainably. Indeed, those are all good lessons. <laughs> They are. Um, and they are, yeah, they're all on the website there too with the final, this is the final report is online. Um, yeah, uh, so many of them. The, I mean, at the time, there were all these questions about um, could something online be authoritative? Um, and I think that now we're, in a, we're at a stage culturally and in sort of publishing in general where we know that things can be, more and more scholars are citing things <laughs> digital, um, and more and more of us are publishing things digital. The one thing that I would add to that that I wanna um, sort of, I would like to um, uh, focus on a little bit more is that we have to be very explicit with online publications and online projects about sort of um, communicating to users how they're, how they're made and how they're maintained and where they came from, like what the status of that publication is. Um, I don't know how many times I've been sent a link and someone's like, hey Greg, this is, look at this ch amazing online publication. And I go and I look at it and it looks cool, but I can't find a publishing date. I can't find if it's been revised or if it will be revised. I sometimes can't find the publisher name. Um, like very basic things that in a print book you can take for granted because you, you have the authoritative thing, you have the, the thing in front of you, it feels concrete. But on, online, we really need to be very explicit with users about that. We need to say to them, this is being archived in these ways. This is being revised every so and so years or months or never, and this is how we're documenting those revisions. Um, this is the, these are the people responsible for this thing. So that's one big thing that I would sort of elaborate on that one for sure. Um, I could elaborate on the others. Is there any <laughs> uh, one of the others that you want me to? Well, I mean, I think we that touched a lot on it. things sustainably. Yeah. Um, I was curious if we might touch again on the intellectual property as manageable. Yeah, and that was for certainly um, a big concern at the time and, and still a concern about how do we deal with rights, uh, image rights, and that's obviously an art historical publishing 
Um, like there's, you know, that's a whole field. It's a whole, it's a whole, um, de there are departments in, public, in publications, publishing departments dedicated to rights um, and that kind of thing. I think we've seen rights holders be more and more open to digital rights, certainly. We're still at a point though, and we think about this, uh, and so at the time when, when they started the OSCE, they, wasn't even, they weren't even sure they were gonna be able to get digital rights, and now I think we, th we think we can. Mostly we get digital rights for everything we publish fairly easily without too much, it's just like an add-on at this point. We do have to, however, and this goes back to the dependencies thing, we have to um, re-up those rights after, often after a certain amount of years or a certain amount of even visits or downloads, depending on how they're measuring. So that's another thing to think about in dependency land. Um, if you have to go and, and re-up your rights every five years for, for 40 of your comparative image illustrations, it gives you pause. Um, and this question came from a CRSA member, and perhaps for both of you. Um, I think we've all come across online catalogs resume that um, have been abandoned. <coughs> Um, so what, what is the preservation potential there if something has been abandoned? I think we've all come across things that were made 10 years ago. They're still there. Um, it's still got somebody's email up there, but if you email, you're not going to get in touch with them. So what, what happens to those? Do those just live on? Is there any thought about that? Is that? Does that responsibility lie always with the scholar, the maker, or with the cust potential custodian, a library, or an archive? Or how do we approach that? <laughs> <laughs> um, normally, we arrange a sort of schedule um, with the in inverted commas owner of a catalogue visone so that we would visit it once a year if it doesn't change a lot more frequently. Um, so, I think if we didn't you know, see any activity on a site, we would get sort of curious and try and contact the, mm -hmm. what we thought were the owners who gave us the permission for it. Mm -hmm. um, and in emergencies, when we've seen like a gallery site, not a catalog of museums, you know, closing down, we've made an emergency decision that we're going to have a snatch, snapshot of it okay. and, you know, for posterity and, and the lawyers can get me afterwards for that. <laughs> and once it's archived, you keep the archive. It's not going anywhere just because yeah. it's been abandoned, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and uh, I think that's a good point about you really sort of plan, like, Plan to abandon it, maybe. Like, <laughs> assume that at some point you're going to walk away. Um, and that, think about how, and I love Stephen's point at the end of his talk when you talked about, um, <coughs> think about how people are going to want to use that information down the road. They might not need the fancy interactive. They might really just want the data or whatever. But think about that and give that some thought. Otherwise, you're going to be left with whatever the Wayback Machine happens to have caught. Right. And this is probably one last question for you, Greg. Um, I think a lot of the appeal about an online catalog resume is cost. Um, people feel like it is more cost effective because you're not um, using paper, you're not working with a printer or maybe a designer in the same way. Um, and I wanted to touch on that. Is that true? It's not true for us. Um, and I don't know if all of you, and I would like to hear from anyone who does think, who's been working on one and does think it's cheaper. We find that we still have the same cost for editorial costs are still the same, translation, rights clearances. Um, in place of a print designer, we have a developer or a UX designer. Um, the only thing that we're saving money on is the initial large outlay for print, printing the book, um, PPB or paper print and binding. Um, however, that, and that outlay is often recouped when you sell the book. So that kind of evens itself out. So for us, it's often a question of like, if we, we could publish online and lose, I'll say $20,000, or we could publish on, on, in print and it would cost us more, but we'd sell some and recoup some of that cost, but it's still, we'd still lose $20,000. So either way, I think it's kind of, we're trying to make decisions based less on cost and more on um, like what's appropriate. And, and for us, online catalogs and online applications, um, the benefit for them is we can uh, reach a larger audience, we can do things dynamically, we can include a lot of images and zooming and that kind of thing that we wouldn't be able to do in print. Um, sometimes there are things that are niche that the, even the, the print market for it, wouldn't, we don't think is enough to recoup the cost, so we do it that way. But yeah, we, we, we don't assume that it's gonna be ch the, the sort of common, the common idea that, that it would be cheaper. Yeah. Great. I think we'll open it up to the audience. So please raise your hand if you have a question. The 
digital publishing geniuses. That's great. Oh. Hi, um, thank you so much for this um, very fascinating panel. For someone doing a catalog raisonné such as I am without any foundation support, an orphaned artist, long dead, no relatives, no, no real copyright issues, but um, I'm not getting any younger, so say I managed to get it, uh, my software updated and get it online, what, it, what will happen after I'm gone? I can't afford to, you know, leave my estate to maintaining a catalog raisonné. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some foundation that could, say, endow the Frick or the Getty or some consortium to um, adopt catalog raisonnés for posterity, um, n maybe not even compensating the scholar, but guaranteeing their living on after the life of the scholar. Thank you. I mean, at the moment, <coughs> we take on academics' papers that relate, you know, sometimes to a catalog is on it that's never going to be published. Um, we, I mean, we're always open to, you know, if you've got a website up and you want it to be archived, uh, suggest it and we'll see if we can. And I, I, I would add, too, that the, um, yeah, I think that there's, there's, my guess is in um, a few years from now, we will see more and more interest in that, I, that question about who is going to be his custodian for it. I think NIARC is doing great work. I think there are some others just starting to think about it, and maybe it would expand to something. Um, because more and more of us are publishing these things, and, and by nature, we're going to be like, now we're at a point where we're like, oh, we got to take care of them now. Like, we got to do something about this. Um, I think that the challenge in that, that you all should be aware of as you're, as you're building these, these publications, and as you're publishing them, and as you're making decisions on the, in the sort of back end decisions, is that they can be, um, they can be very difficult to capture, as Stephen pointed out. If it's got a complicated database or something, it can't. Having trying to capture that database is very can be very difficult and costly. Um, also, trying to keep that database running can be difficult and costly. And imagine now that all say there's 40 of you, 40 catalog raisonnés coming out of this room. How many of them are going to be on the same database? How many of them are going to be on wildly different things? And so. Ask, thinking about that and f having a foundation or any other institution trying to take on 40 different databases, my digital department would freak out. Like they would like, they would, they would, their heads would explode. But that's, so we have to think that's about a ways great to idea to, to make um, a software and invite scholars to adapt it. Yeah. To adopt it yeah. and then adopt the catalog raisonnés at the end. Mm -hmm. Maybe the scholar puts in some funds or the foundation, but then um, they give it to the institution to maintain. Yeah. But the software is standardized by the consortium. Mm -hmm. My, yeah, that would be um, great, a great way to do it, certainly. Bloomberg are doing some interesting projects. They're trying to create a museum app that is, is a sort of basic standard, but it can be adapted by museums. Um, and again, if they did something like a museum, uh, system for, you know, a lot of museums publish catalog raisonnés that, that mm -hmm. might be mileage in making them yeah. think of that. Any other questions? You can also, oh yeah. Uh, well, I may be revealing a, a very high level of naivete here with this question. But it, it seems to me from things I've bought, um, books I've bought that have CDs in the back of them. <laughs> Everybody laughs, you know something, I don't know yet. Um, that in between the printed catalog and an online thing, which requires, it seems, a lot of money to maintain, there's a CD, which is something that would be in some ways a backup or a fallback, but also in and of itself, it's a document. And then to pick up on the earlier question then, is there a place like a library for CDs? 
that are maintained so that at the worst case, a person can go to that library, call up the CD, see the, the, the CD version of the catalog resume, which then at least it is available for the future and hasn't had to be the, the $50,000 of printing that's involved. Yeah, I think, I think that um, a CD, I've got a question behind you too, or uh, a response no, maybe. I, I, have a, I have a catalog resume, Edward Hopper, I'm Gail Levin, from 1995 with all the provenance on a CD, which never could work on a Mac. Uh, this was published with the Whitney and W.W. W. Norton, never could work on a Mac, cannot work on an up-to-date PC can only work on my surviving ancient PCs. <laughs> and so that's not the solution unless yeah. you keep updating the technology all the time. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, yeah. it's one of my big concerns. <laughs> yeah, no, Thank that's you. exactly right. I think CDs like, or a storage, just think about a, any kind of storage like that. If you just put a, a Word document on a CD, maybe like that's something. But like oftentimes a CD-ROM will be like the Hopper catalog where it's a very, like a very specific format that requires very specific software to run. And so you end up having to emulate or keep that software running to be able to run the CD. Um, certainly, yeah, certainly though having, it's, it's another format, it's another way of going, but I would, I would want that to be one part of many things that I was doing, for sure. Um, and then, yeah, I'll leave it at that. A couple of questions over here. The microphone's coming over. <coughs> Um, I'm wondering if there's an analogy between newspapers, which initially made their digital copies available free, and then they learned that, in fact, people would pay for them, and often what is, perp it, what is paid for is, in fact, valued, and there's an incentive on, in, in the entire sort of system then to keep it up to date, and so I'm wondering if there, whether or not it's done under the guise of a nonprofit institution or a profit-making but some way in which users, either individually or through an aggregated service as in a library, can in fact recognize the value of what they're buying and help to sustain it in that way. Do you know of any sort of efforts like that? Um, um, there are certainly, so, I mean, there are certainly some things that are doing like a, a paid model. I mean, Artifacts is offering a subscription model. I'm sure some of you are using Artifacts or thinking about it, or maybe Artifacts is here. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also the Yale University Pr um, Press is doing a Mellon funded um, platform that is, it's more like um, um, chunking up chapters of, of books, of art historical texts. Um, where someone can subscribe and go in and kind of re recombine them and then it, someone can purchase that sort of recombined version. It's kind of aimed at a textbook market. Um, I guess I would wonder if the, um, I think with any of those models, I wonder how much of the payment is considered like upkeep or about like sustainability. Like I, I would be interested to see a system that was like, if you pay this, we are, you know, X amount is going to continue to preserve this or whatever. I think that that's um, an interesting idea. I don't know that it's being done specifically with preservation in mind, um, for sure. I don't, do you, does anyone else no, know anything? I, I think there are possibilities like JSTOR with its text mm -hmm. and art store, you know, could be perhaps encouraged to explore mm -hmm. this area. And I do think the idea of, is it's worth highlighting your point about sometimes things that are paid are seen as being more valued. Um, and I think that's probably still true. I think we find with our books that they're, like whereas a newspaper has a much larger audience, um, that the, our books are such small audiences um, and the, I, that you'd have to pay a lot. I mean, you get, I guess, which is, which you would pay a lot for a, a, a textbook, a printed textbook, I guess, too. So, all right, I take that back, never mind. I'll, I'll think about that more, thank you. Um, this question is for Andrea. Um, you mentioned briefly about the implications that the decision to go digital-born catalog made. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. And then also, what database or what format did you end up using? And what is the plan um, for longevity? Like, how will it be accessed? That's a lot of questions. Or maybe number two and three. <laughs> 
Let me start with the last one, perhaps. We do not have a plan yet. That's part of the reason why we have the panel today, to kind of start the conversation, really, and learn from others and see what this conversation could bring in the end. Um, Regarding the beginning of it, um, I was not involved in the choice. Um, I started right when the database was um, produced, and we are working with Panopticon, who is also here today, a representative, and we're very happy with the database. Uh, we've learned a lot. We've grown together in a way, um, and we'll see where it will lead us. Um, I'm concerned about um, uh, when my colleagues and I are pass on our catalog resume to the new gener another generation, and how the catalog resume can be can can reflect our, our authorship. And I know that NIARC is working on that, but I mean it, 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 it's it's a huge concern, I think, because for authenticity issues and that kind of thing. So I don't know if there's a if there's technology that I don't know about or that we should we should pursue. But I think it's a real problem because um, you know these catalog online catalogs resonate in theory should last in perpetuity and be updated and have new um, uh, new connoisseurship. So mm -hmm. do you do any of you have a comment about that? <laughs> That's a profound philosophical question, which <laughs> if I had an answer, I would <laughs> be gladly share it. But um, it, it, is an, it is an issue. How do you update things you know, beyond your life and beyond having you know, people interested in the artist who want to carry that torch further? It, it's difficult. But, what do you do? but you've got archived versions, that's what well, we're doing. That's, that's so that's it would reflect the right. revisions over that's time. Yeah. 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 yeah, I would, I mean, and that goes back to the point I made about sort of um, establishing the book's um, status and its authorship and um, when it was revised and in what way it was revised and who revised it. Um, I think having a system that enables you to track that can be very important. Um, it's an interesting thing that we run again, up against in, um, at the Getty in a lot of ways because the idea of authorship online is actually kind of weird. Um, like there's not, authorship is not something that a lot of web developers or web designers or, you know, think of. It's just uh, the Getty website, like who knows who wrote that, right? It's been <laughs> like parts of it were probably written when it was first developed in the 90 whatever. Um, and certainly other people have added on to it ever since and there's no record of who those people are. So when I as a publisher come and say, well, I, this my, my part of the website is authored, like there's a name on that and it's important to us, it gets a little like, yeah, there's a kind of like, like from a web developer, it's like, what? Like who cares about the author's name? It's like <laughs> the author does. Um, and, the but, and as researchers as well need to be able to cite an author. Um, and so, and we're just starting to add essays onto our collection pages. So the collection pages are just sort of, they're the, the data coming out of the, out of the uh, museum's collection database that's updated by curators sort of regularly, but they also want to be able to now add in essays that are authored. And it's been a big, it's, it's taken a bit. Yeah, but it's a great, it's a big philosophical question that um, there's no grand solution to at the moment, but it's a good question to be asking, for sure. I think also that we should perhaps sort of like question the status of the printed as well. We and Catalogue Rizones have different editions, um, changes happen, and you know, reliably some of the information gets mangled in editorial and things like that. I also have a, um, a, I have a question about um, ownership. So... Uh, I work for a foundation, 
for the, I'm, I'm working on the Tony Smith catalog resume of sculpture. Uh, let's say we have a, a database. Do we want it on our servers? Do we want it on someone else's servers? Do we want it to live um, in a library? Or do we want it to live on this um, foundation that does not yet exist where everything will be um, preserved? It, it, like a Library of Congress, almost a uh, digital archive. And what's the mechanism for that? Because it does not yet exist. But there is something certainly in the, sh in the short term that we all do have to deal with. Where will this information live short term and long term? And who owns it? Yeah, and I think that goes back to this idea of like, is there a, are, is there a con consortium be put together that could own these things in per, you know, for a longer period um, and take responsibility for them. And maybe, that ha maybe that, there's an opportunity for that to happen on earlier than you know, sooner in the process, like even to the point of like when it's first published. Maybe it should be published to that consortium rather than being moved to it after the fact. Maybe that's a good, um, a good approach, an interesting approach. Um, whereas now I think we're in a period where all we can, the best we're doing is we're all going about it, publishing on you know, the way we publish and then looking to archiving, web archiving solutions like NIARC and, web and the web, uh, internet archive. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We have another couple in the front here. One here and here and here. Oh. <laughs> yes, hi. I was wondering if you, in any of this research that you've been doing, if you've been consulting or including time-based media conservators or library and archives conservators in those conversations? Uh, sort of, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll um, admit to not doing it f right up front. We act, but being at the Getty, we're very lucky to have the Getty Research Institute right there and a bunch of people working on digital preservation very specifically. And in fact, I have a lunch with our new head of digital preservation on Monday or you know, in a week um, to talk about it more. Uh, but it's um, what, we're do what we're hoping to do um, is I've kind of had it in mind and I've been thinking the way we've built our system is more archivable than a lot of other systems um, that are out there. And, and um, what I have in mind to do now is to build that archiving and archivability and preservation sort of system in from the beginning, especially if we're thinking about open sourcing the software. Um, but yeah, those are great resources for people that really are tackling this. Like we're not alone. We're not just because we, we have this problem with these catalog raisonnés or with online catalogs. There are lots of people doing digital preservation for all kinds of things that can help. Yeah, it's a great point. Thank and you. And the web recorder project came out of time-based media um, pressures to actually cover that area. Thanks. Thank you. These front questions, did you have a, oh, you got them, thank you. Uh, just uh, following up on an earlier question and kind of directed at Greg, because you're coming from the Getty and get to deal with uh, brush fires and uh, earthquakes, <laughs> but uh, do you, can you speak at all to the idea of geographically, physically distributed backup? Um, and obviously, web-based, cloud-based archiving services uh, kind of have opened up a whole new world in the past few years. But is there something to be said for just sort of old-fashioned, like have a hard drive buried in a silo somewhere in North Dakota? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I love that idea. I love the idea of burying, like literally burying a hard drive full of my digital publications. Like, <laughs> They're gonna love this Roman mosaics catalog in a hundred years. <laughs> so good. Um, I'm so nerdy in the way to like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, part of the multi-format thing does a lot of that for us because there are copies like naturally being distributed out into the world in the Library of Congress and everybody else. Um, on our website, like the online stuff, it's hosted on multiple servers and multiple locations, kind of like by nature, as sort of as the Getty, we kind of do that automatically. Um, we haven't gone as far as like here is uh, like a hard drive disconnected from the internet and like in a, in a place in a couple different places. Um, but, I, but maybe that's a thing, yeah. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? That's, I mean, we're kind of doing it sort of by default, I would yeah. say, yeah. yeah. Do you have any tips? Uh, back up early and often. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, as I'm listening, it seems to me there's a little bit of a disconnect uh, and maybe even a contradiction in the main discussion has been permanence to a certain extent uh, of the catalog raisonné itself and ongoing beyond the life of the author or the team. 
But my impression is that over the last few years, one of the reasons for the popularity, one of the reasons for the popularity of online catalog raising A, is this issue of um, uh, litigation and concern regarding attribution and authenticity, and an idea that got bandied about, I'm not sure I agree with it, but an idea that got bandied about, that if you have an online version that's constantly updated, you're not as liable because it's constantly updated there. If the work is not, if some owner's work is not there, you can say, well, we're not finished yet. I've always opposed that view personally, but nonetheless, I know it is a very popular view. So there's, I, as I'm listening to this conversation, I can't help thinking that that's an impetus, or at least one, for doing the online, and yet the whole discussion has been about the permanence Cement. of, you know, and locking in at a moment in time. And regarding the thing that Steve was referring to about the editions, when you have an, a, a print version, scholars have already known how to deal with that. You refer to the de la Fai of <coughs> one year or another year or another year, and that's the version that you're referring to when you're making your reference and your citation. Uh, so scholars have adapted to the fact of the, um, the new editions of print versions, whereas I don't know that we know how to deal with this constantly changing online version when that is one of the points of the online version. So just a thought, maybe you have some comments or others have comments about that. Did this fall on dead ears? No, no, it's really interesting. I like had, an, and that's coming from a non like catalog raisonné background. Like I didn't even, it, of course there must be legal issues, but it didn't have occurred to me that there would be. Yeah. I think it definitely comes back. I mean, to me, it comes back to that idea of, of version control and revision history and being very clear about when things happen and who hap and when. Like I think that you just need that in authorship. I think that's you're walking a line if you're not doing that, if you're leaving it to be open, it's like, a, it's just, it, it's, up, it's always being updated, don't worry about it. Like, there's a, you, you um, degrade or you undercut the authority of the publication yeah. you're making. So yeah, there's this sort of balance or this line that you have to walk for sure. Um, we use uh, GitHub for um, all of our project management. And this GitHub is a project management site for coders but it's becoming more and more popular for just anything that can be expressed in plain text, essentially. Um, so like our plain text documents. And what GitHub does is it uses a, a version control system called Git down to the, and it, it tracks everything to the character level. So we have a record of every change that's been made in our catalog, character by character, and who made it from the moment we uploaded it to GitHub on. Um, it would be, uh, we're interested to see like what anyone will ever do with that. Um, because we kind of, we have a very simplified revision history. We say, oh, we just made some typographic changes and we changed this attribution on this one entry and that, you know, but, but there's actually a lot of little things going on in there. So, but scholars haven't figured out how to use GitHub yet, so we don't have to worry about it. So, but I'm interested to see like when they can get the, that final level of like revision history, what would, what the, how does that change scholarship? I have a question about some of the publications you talked about, how you've um, gotten them out there in many, many formats, the website, <coughs> print on demand. So are you, are, with some of those websites, are there changes that are happening to them that then are reflected in the future print on demand? So different versions and different libraries have different information? Yep. <laughs> yeah, we haven't figured that one out either. That's another one of those like, we'll see what they say. But what we do, our policy is that we, um, so once we publish something, it's got the publication date on it. We, um, at, we're making kind of revisions on a rolling basis, but not pushing them up to the site. We're using GitHub again. So we have a sort of separate version of the publication that's the revisions version that we're kind of just making changes to or corrections to as we go, but it's kind of unofficial at that point. At the point at which the editor says those revisions are significant again, enough to warrant pushing up, then we, do, we push them all up at once, we put a date on it, we put a list of what we did, and then in the other edition, so that, and then that says that on the online edition, and then for the print editions and everything, it says last update, there's a, on the copyright page changes, and it says last updated January 24th, 2017. Um, 
in the print edition, it's not very specific about that, but we do include the GitHub address so people could track back to see like what was changed when. We don't know yet, we haven't gotten any feedback about like, well, that's not cool, or like, oh, that's awesome. So we don't know how it's gonna go, but that's how we're handling it. It's a good, but yes, so di potentially, a libraries could have two slightly different versions, and the only way to tell is on the copyright page and the little last updated date. All right. Yep. Yep. So, so the, in the front, she asked, she uh, mentioned, no one has brought up the issue of hacking, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> uh, we our particular system is in one in which it's not a database back system, so it was it, there's not much to hack in it. Um, we also I kind of think of it as like, I mean, again, because I'm not dealing with these legal issues that many of you are, um, and so I hadn't even thought about this until now, but. Um, uh, I kind of think of, so when ebooks first started, when ebooks first became a thing with a Kindle, everyone was like, oh, ebooks, we have to put piracy, all of our books are going to be pirated, and oh my gosh, and we're going to lose all of our money because everyone's going to take all the ebook editions and not buy anything ever more, anymore. So that was a big worry. And one of the, a publisher was like, pirating, like, that's not anyone's problem, but like, you know, JK Rowling, and like, like, those are the people that are worried about pirating, and that's who it's happening to. If someone pirates our books, like, thank you, like, you know, like, <laughs> you just help me get it out more. So like, on that way, and hacking, I kind of think of the same thing, like, because I'm not worried about the hacking stuff. But, but, but in the recently, yeah, it's, it's a different issue. issue. Yeah. It's a statement of yeah. the body of an artist's yeah. work at a moment in time, so. Um, and and for that, yeah, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's is anyone else dealing with the hacking stuff or about security issues on the databases of their of their catalog race names. Okay, so then maybe that's the next. Heard that it's happened. Yeah, it's heard that's happened. Is yeah. That. Right. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's not something we want to talk about as a community. But maybe we should be. Maybe there should be a panel on security that I would not be on, but I would be happy to attend because I'd learn some things too. But yeah. We have one more here. Are we at a time? I'm wondering if the dynamic quality of an online catalog raisonné, if that's something that's worth preserving, how you move through the site or how you access information, if that's something that you're also thinking about, just because we've also been talking a lot about the preservation of just the raw data, like in plain text. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Um, I mean, you can never sort of replicate an individual's use of um, an online catalogue raisonné. So you could record that on a video or something like that, but the actual experience, I, I think, is going to be pretty flat on an archive website. Um, but again, we are interested in finding out how people are engaging with catalogue raisonné in a digital art history sense. I think that um, I think your idea of like a video, so like web archiving will will capture some of the, some of the interaction, some of the moving, but not a lot of the moving parts. So a lot of them will disappear. But I think that yeah, like doing a video, like a simpler, like a fallback capture of your user experience, is not a bad idea. Like if especially if it's something that has meaning to the content of the catalog, I'd say I'd think about it. Like if it's just about you just think that the navigation is cool, but it doesn't really have any deep connection then that's one thing. But if it's actually, if you've managed to, to build a catalog raisonné in which the interface is highly connected and um, in interplay with the content, then that's definitely something I would want to capture. And I would go about it with like videos and, and probably screenshots and a lot of other things. Um, and I think that sort of digital preservation archiving thinks about that too, where they think about like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna archive the content, the text, I'm gonna archive the experience and like in different buckets. So yeah, it's a great question. What about, um, I guess, what about saving the code? I mean, when we're talking about everything that's online, it's written, you know, we don't really experience it that way, but are you actively just saving, you know, like a text file of the code that goes into writing those websites? We, de we definitely are. I think that, um, and that's what GitHub is doing for us. And the, the system that we use is called a static site generator, so it's actually putting out flat pages rather than a database. 
So those flat pages are represented in GitHub as well as being hosted online, so all the code is there and can be seen, for sure. And that's a good way of, like, of, of capturing some of that where uh, someone could look at that potentially and make some sense of it, even if it doesn't operate the same anymore. Yeah, for sure, it's great. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. And I really want to thank our panel. This was the brainchild of Andrea. Uh, when we first started talking about it, she was the driving force behind it. And that is what we want CRSA to be is member driven. So if you have ideas, please reach out. Um, they can definitely come to interesting fruition. And thank you to Stephen and Greg for leading us through this um, conversation. Uh, we may not come away with an exact map of what we can do, but a lot of things to think about and I think uh, fodder for future conversations. So please join me in thanking the panel and join us for a reception afterwards. Thank you.